Hi, and welcome to this part two of our second video course for novice machinists that's all about safety. In last week's video, while well, we looked at safety in general terms, or philosophically if you like, we looked at basic common sense rules and regulations that will permit you to complete a project physically intact. Today we're going to be looking more specifically at safety. Well, actually we're going to be looking at safety as it specifically relates to different types of machines. We're going to be looking at safety for bench grinders, for drill presses, for band saws, for lathes, for milling machines, and for surface grinders. But before we get into that, I'd like to tell a little story. A few weeks ago, I was out for lunch with some friends. I know, that's pretty incredible. I do have some friends. And we were out to lunch, but as I get to the restaurant, I notice that in the parking there's some paving going on. So I go around the work area into the next row and go down the row. Now halfway down I notice that there's a cone, a safety cone, positioned on a manhole cover in the center of a large pad that had been repaved. So I'm very careful to avoid the manhole cover and I go around and head on my way. A few seconds after that, a paving worker comes up to me and says, Hey, didn't you see the cone? I said, Yeah, I went around it. He says, No, that means that you're not allowed to ro run on the pad for at least a half an hour. Well, being Canadian, I immediately excused myself and indicated to the person that I would be more careful in the future and proceeded on to park a little further away. But then I said to myself, no, this is a classic example of miscommunication. Now that single cone in the middle of a large pad for that worker meant you are not allowed to pass on this pad. Well, that was not clear. Really, he should have had four cones, one in each corner of the pad, uh, defining that that pad was off limits. But more than that, he had also added that it was important not to run or roll on the pad for at least a half an hour after it had been paved. And then I thought to myself again, well how could I know how long ago that pad had been paved? I couldn't. Again, miscommunication. There should have been a sign saying, uh, beware, uh, do not roll or run on pad for at least a half an hour starting at this time. Now, that's crazy. But it is an example of miscommunication. It has nothing to do with safety. I mean, I wasn't going to fall into an abyss if I rolled on that pad. But, uh, you know, it, it is miscommunication. And miscommunication is a huge problem in shops. I mean, many, many accidents happen because dangerous situations were not properly explained. So be very careful when you set up a safety area, when you delimit a zone that should not be accessed, when you put up a sign. Make certain that it is completely and utterly clear as to what is going on. You must never ever suppose that an idiot such as myself in that parking lot would have known that I wasn't supposed to run there. So, miscommunication, very important. Now, let's take a look at bench grinders, but I want to add as well, I can't be exhaustive here. I can't cover all the details. I'm going to hit the high points for each machine type. But you may want to add things and that's what the comments are for below there. Please don't use the comments on this video to tell me that the sound on the video is no good. I know that already. And well, there's I have no microphone and my camera doesn't have a jack for a microphone. So this is as good as it's going to get. Don't use the comments to tell me how good I am. I already know that. 
Don't use the comments to tell me how sexy I am, because that just goes to my head. Don't use the comments down there in this video to add your own experiences, your own safety stories, and any safety rule that you use that I won't mention in this video. So let's take a look at bench grinders. The first thing that comes to mind as far as safety goes for pedestal grinders is all the safety equipment that comes with the machine. We're talking here about the tool rest, the side shield, the spark arrester, and the face shield. These are integral parts of the machine and must remain functional. Do not remove them and make sure to adjust them regularly. The next point that needs to be made for home shop safety as far as pedestal grinders go is the rated RPM of the abrasive wheel as indicated on the side blotters of the wheel. It is crucial that the indicated RPM on the abrasive wheel be equal or higher than the maximum RPM of your grinder. Now, should the wheel turn faster than it's rated for, well, you can get a wheel that will fracture. And obviously, we don't have to think very hard to figure out that that is very dangerous. The next safety point I'd like to make is for novice machinists, mostly. And that is to avoid grinding non-ferrous metals on your bench grinder. Now, non, most non-ferrous metals have very low uh, melting points and they tend to gall up your wheel easily. And that, well, is, means that you have metal encrusted into the grinding wheel and that it can no longer cut. It's just going to rub and that eventually will lead to major problems. So, avoid if possible because remember, most non-ferrous metals or many non-ferrous metals are quite soft and easy to cut so they can be easily filed. It's also a good idea to use the tool rest on your pedestal grinder to stabilize your hands position. And what do I mean by that? Well we all know that the tool rest is made to rest the tool on or whatever you're grinding to stabilize it. But when we hold apart, oftentimes we're moving around. It's a bit like holding a video camera freehand. We never get a stable shot. That tool rest has a front edge on it, upon which you can rest one of the fingers that isn't being used to hold the part that you're grinding. Now, since in many cases your fingers are going to get quite close to the grinding well, especially if you're sharpening small lathe tools or things like that, well, really it is important to stabilize your hand's position so you don't go up and nick your finger on the grinding wheel. So use the tool rest to support your part and stabilize it, but also to stabilize your hand's position. The last point I want to make about pedestal grinders in this video, well, is to take a few minutes I'm going to watch my video on pedestal grinders. In that video I explain all kinds of things like adjusting the tool rest, the importance of the blotters on the abrasive wheel, uh, how to sharpen a grinding wheel, uh, how to check a grinding wheel for cracks before mounting it, and so on and so forth. So take a few minutes, here's a link, and go and watch that video if you want to. For now, we're going to move on to the drill press. There are a lot of pedestal grinders kicking around in our workshops, but the drill press, even though there are less, is the most popular machine tool around. Well, that's just because a pedestal grinder isn't a machine tool. It doesn't have at least one accurate, controllable axis of motion, but our drill press does. So. Let's look at safety for the drill press and I think the first thing to mention is long hair. Every year people are disfigured, maimed, injured or even sometimes killed by hair being caught in rotating parts of machines. 
Now this is true for all machines, but where it happens most often is the drill press. Now that is a major problem and it does happen in the blink of an eye. It sounds like something that would almost be funny, but it isn't because as I said, it does kill, maim, disfigure and injure. Now, if you want to be grossed out, Google it. I'm sure you'll find videos talking about it, but you probably don't want to do that. Just take my word for it. Getting your hair caught in a spindle is horrific. Now, for me, that's not a problem. But what can you do if you have long hair? Well, the no-brainer part is, we'll get it cut. If it's short enough not to fall or move when you bend over, it's probably all right. But if it is long and you want to keep it, and since I've lost most of my hair, I would really like to have long hair. We always want what we can't have. Well, probably tie it up, one, but do not make a braid or a ponytail. Tie it up, curl it up, and put it into a bonnet or a cap. No hair falling out of. Very, very important. It's something that happens regularly, all over the world and they are really horrific accidents and it does happen just like that. So long hair not in a machine shop or control it with a cap or a bonnet. Very important. The second thing that comes to mind is the chuck key on the drill press and that is quite problematic. Now we're always looking for the chuck key and really the best thing to do with a chuck key is to determine a proper space where you keep the chuck key, preferably on a workbench right next to the drill press and not on the drill press table because it's always in the way. Now, sadly, one reaction to the lost chuck key problem is to chain or tie the chuck key to the machine. It is obviously dangerous to start a machine with a chuck key in the chuck and that is the major problem because it will fly off and will hit someone or can hook you. But if you want to make that bad accident potentially a lot worse, well chain or tie the chuck key to the drill press to make it easy to find. Well it might be easier to find because it's going to be on the end of that chain or cord. But if you forget the chuck key in the chuck and turn it on, that flying around chain and cord can grab a lot more. And worse, if it does break and start to whip around, well, it's like an industrial sized whipper snipper. And obviously it will do some serious damage to anyone that's in its way. So on the drill press, keep your chuck key out of the chuck at all times, except when you're using it. Never leave it in the chuck. Big, big mistake. And secondly, try and avoid, really, it's just a common sense, tying the chuck key in some way. Now, if you have a magnet, a lot of people do that. They place a magnet on the side of the head of the machine and put the chuck key there. That is fine and no problem. But really, tying it to the machine, bad idea. Chuck keys, very dangerous. Thirdly, if your drill press is not equipped, with a worm and rack gear to adjust the height of the table, well, it is important to fix onto the column of the drill press a clamp that will stop the table from falling all the way to the ground should it be let go during adjustment. And this is crucial because obviously if it goes all the way to the ground, well, it can injure legs or feet that might be in the way. Now, this problem is compounded by leaving a vise or a heavy part on the drill press table when adjusting its height. So that is something that we just do not want to do. Now, worm gears have one interesting property. Well, they have several, but one of those properties that's interesting in this case is that they cannot be reversed or not auto reversing. So you can crank the table up or you can crank it down, but gravity will not spin the worm gear. So it's sort of like automatically locking and that is a good thing. But if you don't have it, use a clamp somewhere on the column to stop the table from falling all the way. The fourth thing to think about, well, is using 
milling machine vices on a drill press. And I point over there because that's where my milling machine is. Now, drill press vices are light. They're usually made of cast iron. They are very low profile and quite wide. That makes them stable, even when they aren't clamped down onto the table. And obviously because they're light, should an accident occur, well it is less of a problem. Now, milling machine vices are massive. They're heavy and if they're not clamped to the table, they are not necessarily very stable. So avoid milling machine vices. I think it's also important to note here that if you're using a radial arm drill press and not one of these pedestal drill presses, well in that case milling machine vices are acceptable because the radial arm drill press has T-slots that are made to hold down a milling machine vise. So sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, but in the home shop it's pretty well never good because very few people in the home shop have a radial arm drill press. The fifth situation safety wise on the drill press and one that does cause a lot of accidents is the snagging of parts while drilling a hole. Now any part can be snagged but for different reasons. So let's start by looking at thin parts. Thin parts are a problem because when you're drilling a thin part well the point, the chisel edge of the drill that's working its way through the part exits the bottom of the part before the cutting lips are done their job. And what creates back pressure that controls the tool going through the part, well it's the chisel edge. And once it's gone, well the part can easily thread its way up onto the drill. And that is a great problem. Because, well, once it threads up, it gets jammed on and it starts to rotate and becomes a cutting blade that is very, very dangerous. So what can we do to avoid that? Well, we could sandwich a thin part, especially a very thin part, should be sandwiched between thicker parts of a similar material. And that will permit you to drill through, clamping it on the table or in a vise safely because it's supported on both sides and will not ride up because of its thickness. But another way to resolve that problem, if your part is thin but not incredibly thin, would be to use some kind of jig, or a fixture in this case because it wouldn't guide the tool, some kind of fixture that would impede the part's movement. And here's an example of what one of those fixtures could look like. It permits the drilling, but it stops the part from riding up onto the drill, and it impedes its rotation if it gets jammed. So something you could set up on your drill press with just scrap parts you can find around the shop. Now as we've just seen, snagging a part as the drill exits the bottom is a real problem with thin parts, but it's a problem with any thickness of part because obviously there's no longer back pressure and the drill wants to thread itself onto the bottom of the part. And that's always a problem. So what do we do to avoid that? Well, we're attentive to our pressure as we cut. So we apply pressure as we cut, and as soon as we feel that we're starting to break through, the pressure, you can feel it reducing. Well, we purposely reduce the amount of force we apply to let the drill cut smoothly through the bottom of the hole. And that's something we sort of get used to doing. But, there is a problem with soft materials. We're talking here about uh, most plastics, about brass, about lead, about copper, about aluminum. These materials offer very little resistance to penetration, so the chisel edge on the drill has a hard time doing its job of producing back pressure. So what do we do? Well, the best thing to do with soft materials is to use a straight flute drill. The point geometry on a split safe, well, in a, sorry about that, straight flute drill, that's hard to say for a Frenchman, well, is the same. It, it is no different, a helical flute or a straight flute. But obviously, the flutes are straight. Now, if they are straight 
and it wants to snag in the hole at any time because a soft material can be snagged at any time well it obviously won't ride up why because the flutes are straight and that resolves the problem but having a set of straight flute drills around the shop can be expensive for a home shop anyways so what can you do well you can modify the tip of the drill and produce very small flats on the cutting lip that mimic a straight flute drill and will really resolve your problem and since you can do this on a cheap set of drills and the soft materials don't require the best drills in the world to work for because not a lot of a cutting pressure is applied well this is something you could do to a set of drills and keep them handy around for jobs when you're drilling soft materials so snagging always a problem so we've seen measures of reducing the chance of snagging apart but what happens if you do snag a part specifically a large part and one of the problems with snagging large parts is that they start to rotate now they aren't cutting like a sheet would be but they still are quite dangerous because maybe the first turn isn't too bad but as they gain momentum they will eventually break the drill and a very large and heavy part probably with a drill press vise included will start flying across the shop very dangerous so what can we do to avoid that and it's quite simple we either fix the part to the table which is problematic because a lot of drilling operations are self-guiding and you really don't want to fix the part to the table you want to let the part adjust itself to the drill that you're using but what we can do to avoid if we don't want to fix the part to the table is to fix to the table a large or rigid pin or stop that we could lean the part up to or up on to stop it from rotating should the part be snagged now this stop should be high enough to stop the rotation of the part even if the part rises up slightly on the drill this is simple easy to do and it will really save your bacon one important thing however is as you're holding your part or your vise for drilling make sure that the tips of your fingers are not between the edge of the vise and that pin or stop that you have set up on the table because that will again bring you to the purple nail problem or the situation of having your fingers crushed between two parts so a stop on the table will save your bacon another thing that's problematic is unstable parts and what could make a part unstable well obviously if the surface of the part that's resting on the drill press table isn't flat or doesn't have three clear contact points well it will be unstable but that is the obvious problem there are others even a perfect part will become unstable if you do not work cleanly I mean chips between the part and the table are a real no-no dirt or anything really becomes a problem and once the part is unstable well snagging becomes a real problem and there's one other thing that people tend to forget well until they have an accident and then after that they remember that as you drill multiple holes in a part the exit portion of the hole creates a burr okay there is a large burr on that hole as a general rule and as you move the part to the next hole that burr comes to rest on the table and that renders the part unstable so to avoid that if you're drilling multiple holes in a part directly on the drill press table well you will have to deburr your holes at least on the exit side after each hole is drilled very important you want to keep your part stable now the final point that I want to make about drill presses today and as I said there are many more and that's what the comments are for well is that and it probably won't be very popular is that a drill press is a drill press it is not a milling machine and it is not a router I mean the drill press is conceived for 
machining operations that have axial thrust, thrust on the axis of rotation, but it is not conceived for lateral thrust. So drilling, reaming, tapping, uh, boring, yes, no problem, even polishing and some other types of operations, but not for milling or routing because that has axial thrust and the machine just is not designed for that. It is very dangerous to use a drill press as a mill or as a router. So avoid doing it. Well, that's enough drill press safety for now. Remember, this isn't an exhaustive overview. I've really just hit the high points. But we do have several videos on the subject of drill presses. And I think of a five part video in my lesson videos specifically on drill presses. I have the drill point gauge project, the one, two, three block project, the tapping block project, the V block project, where we look at the drilling of several types of holes. And in all of those videos, well, I do touch a lot on safety. So maybe take a few minutes and go and watch some of those videos. There'll be some links at the end of this video. Now, for what's coming up, well, we'll have to set up a part three safety video because we're somewhere around the 26 minute mark already. And that means that, well, this is long enough. So in our part three, we'll be looking at safety related to bandsaws, to lathes, to mills, to surface grinders. And we'll finish off with a little section on fire safety. So until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.